afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank you guys all for coming to the first Alumni Speakers Bureau session of the semester. Um, this is a collaboration between the Student Government Association and the Alumni Association to bring back alums who are either working in New Orleans or are coming back to New Orleans to visit to hear about their work in the professional atmosphere. Um, today we have August Martin, who graduated from the GEHS department in 2000. Um, we are very, very glad to have him here, and we hope you guys will enjoy what he has to say. So thank you for coming back. Um, otherwise, we hope you guys enjoy. There will be more of these during the semester, so we hope you come out to all of them. So with that, Mr. Alex Oh, Morley. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> the, the association would also like to welcome you. We know that you have many things going on and other places to be, so we thank you especially for making time to be here for this. This is part of our commitment to our student body to connect you with people who are working in the field who can talk with you very candidly about their path after graduation and hopefully link you to internship opportunities uh, and other ways to stay connected. So with that, I want to extend to you, August Martin, our gift. Thank you. With our thanks that you came and care about our students and keeping our family together. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. How's everybody doing today? You guys seem like you're asleep. <laughs> well, I am very happy to be here today. I had a really informative and very interesting and exciting meeting with Miss Tatine Freider several months ago. She was going all over the country meeting with alumni and we were talking about ways in which alumni could give back and I told her, I said, if you need me to do anything, I will do it. I will come back and I will talk to students. I will do anything you want. I will be at your disposal. I had no idea she was going to take me up on that, but she did. Thank you very much for doing that. So I was thinking a lot about the topic or something that I could talk to all of you about that would be beneficial to you as students today. And this topic, It All Matters, I think is more appropriate today than it would have been had I heard it when I graduated from the Global Environmental Health Sciences Program in the year 2000, or when I graduated from the Tulane Undergraduate School in Engineering in 1993. There's a few people I'd like to thank before I get started. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Tulane Alumni and Student Government Association for having me. I'd like to thank my company HNTB for sponsoring me to be here. I'd also like to thank the Jennifer Altman Foundation, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. And I'd like to thank my family, because one thing that I want all of you to take away from this is that nobody got to be here alone. Everyone got to be here with the support of family and friends and collaborating with, with someone and having someone support you. So I just want to make sure that we keep that at the front of our minds, that we're not here alone and that we need to rely on each other and support each other throughout our studies and also as we go on, go on into our professional lives. So this topic, what is it about? It all matters. I don't want you to misunderstand the title. Your degree matters greatly, but that's not the only piece of the puzzle. Everything else that you do that you may not think about, those things matter as well. So I want you to do something for me. I want everyone to close their eyes for just a few moments. Don't go to sleep, I know it's lunchtime. Um, and just think about a hobby that you have. Think about something that you like to do, something G-rated that you like to do. Um, think about interesting things that you like to participate in outside of school. 
something pleasant that you that that really allows you to set yourself apart and to relax outside of school all right everybody got something okay let's open our eyes for the rest of the presentation I want you to keep that in mind as as I'm talking so like I said your degree is very important and Tulane is a conversation starter. Tulane is a door opener. So all of you being here, you have a leg up. This is an amazing program. It really is a gateway to you doing wonderful things as you go forward. But there are some other intangible things that you may not be aware of that will help you tremendously in your careers that you may not think about. So when you leave here, you're going to be going up against a lot of talent in a very diverse and very um, large talent pool of students. We hear about unemployment in the United States now. We hear about the economy. We hear about how bad things are in unemployment and underemployment. But I don't want you to be afraid of that. I think that this degree and your experience and how you use those things that I had you close your eyes and think about will make a lot of difference in how you can navigate in the career landscape. So just remember that Tulane is only a door opener. How do we get in the door? So this is a saying that one of my former supervisors told me about eight years ago. When I was working at a company uh, doing a lot of environmental work um, and chemical weapons research, I just knew I had everything figured out. And I was a paper kind of guy. If it made sense on paper, I thought it made sense in the world. So he pulled out this quote and he said, in theory there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. So he was telling me that you think you know everything but once you try to apply it to the real world, there really is a difference in how things operate in the real world. So you have to be careful that you don't stay too much rooted in theory and that you remain open to everything that's around you. So let's talk about who I am in theory or on paper. So we have degrees. I have a couple of degrees from Tulane and a, and a certificate from the University of Texas. That's great. I'm sure you all have credentials as well that you put on paper or on your resume. But what else is important? This is also a snapshot of who I am that tells more of the picture of who I am. These are the companies that I've worked for. I've had 12 job changes with 11 companies over the past 17 years. Eight of those job changes came after I left the School of Public Health in the year 2000. Now, you may be thinking, well, this guy is a serial job changer. Well, that's not the case. There are some things that happened. Some of these were due to the economy. I was a part of a few layoffs. Some were due to family circumstances where I had to come back to New Orleans and tend to my family. Um, so, in theory, I had my path set out, but in practice, this is what my background looks like now. So when I'm approached or when I speak to employers or prospective employers, they see this and some of them are a bit leery and they question my loyalty. But I have to explain to them my story and once they hear my story and I can give them a perspective of why I work for certain companies and why I change jobs, it really opens them up and one item that they see that matters to them today is that I've worked for a diversity of companies. I've worked for consulting firms, I've worked for the federal government, I've worked for a nonprofit, I've worked for a social media company doing outreach to health agencies doing outreach to corporations about social innovation in media. So I try to tie all of those things together for companies to show them that 
This may look like a lot of shifting on paper, but you could use this to your advantage. At one company, I was a manager of about 17 people. At another company, I was served as basically a clerk. So they can see that I've been a great leader, but I'm also a great follower. And that means a lot to, to companies today. So remember what, when I told you guys to close your eyes and think about something that's interesting to your hobbies that you have. Well, here's a little bit about mine. And some of these things have made a huge difference in my career for reasons that you may not think about. And that's why I want to challenge you to think about some of the things that you do that you don't think are important or that you think are just fun that can really set you apart in your career and in your personal lives. So I'm a DJ. I've been a DJ for about 13 years um, in Austin, Texas. I used to follow my neighbor around here in New Orleans when I was in high school and he let me play records when he would DJ school dances. So I always wanted to do it, so I started a DJ company. What that means to my employers have been that I'm an entrepreneur. I had to generate all of my own sales. I've had to create a client base and maintain the client base. And in what I do, that's very important. I, I do a lot of weddings and middle school dances and a lot of outreach to the community. And one very important item to me through DJing that I've been involved with is supporting cancer research in Austin, Texas. I volunteered for the American Cancer Society for several years, and I will be playing music at the Susan G. Komen Foundation race in November 10th, on November 10th of this year in Austin to celebrate um, and remember all of those who we've lost to breast cancer. So that allows me to service the community, and my employers appreciate that because I'm a volunteer. Another important role I played was that I was a resident advisor for several years at Sharp Hall on the Uptown campus. And if you've ever been to or lived in Sharp Hall, that is like one big reality show. <laughs> Everything under the sun happened in Sharp Hall. Fire drills every night, um, drug bust, um, you, you name it. it. It was just, like I said, it was a reality show. But I was in charge of 48 freshman males every year for three and a half years. So what does that mean? That I pulled my hair out. I literally did. I had an afro when I started. I pulled my hair out. Um, but what that means mostly is that I was a crisis manager. I had to deal with people issues daily. I had to make sure that those young men had all of their um, infrastructure needs and their personal needs met. I was sort of their advocate and their advisor and their counselor. Um, and I had to provide an environment for them that was a home away from home while they were with me for, for their freshman year. Um, another item uh, that has really helped me to set myself apart since I've been in technical positions is that I write a lot. I write poetry. So we do a lot of writing and we do a lot of reports and people come to me a lot to proof things. People come to me a lot to write things, which has landed me some great opportunities in the marketing sectors of my companies which I like to do as well. Um, I've also done some recruiting for companies. So, and what they're looking for are people who can be flexible and can navigate certain different areas. So, so these are some of the things that have helped me in my career. So what sets you apart? And just think about some of the things that you do outside of here that sets you apart. All right. Um, if you have a hobby, uh, if you play on an intramural team, uh, if you even 
work or volunteer at the university or in the community. Just think about how that can help you in your career because that stuff matters greatly. It's amazing some of the things that I don't see on resumes that as I'm talking to people, they tell me about. And I say, well, you should really put that on your resume. If you were volunteering for the Louisiana Children's Museum and you were a part of this exhibit, then that's something that you may want to consider putting on your resume. Um, so really think about what sets you apart and don't just think about academics. Think about your personal lives. Think about everything that you do that you feel is interesting. And I'm here to tell you that even the most boring person has something interesting about them. Okay. Well, this is the JBJ. I spent a lot of time in the JBJ when I was here. Um, I moved here from Boston. I was working in Boston at the time. And I just was tired of, of working and I had started the School of Public Health part-time and I really wanted to jump in with both feet so I decided to quit my job in Boston and enroll full-time in 1999 to finish my degree. So I came here, wasn't sure what I was going to do and a friend of mine introduced me to a gentleman named Dr. Don Hodges. At the time he was working in the JBJ at the, at the Energy Spatial Analysis and Research Lab. So I met with Dr. Hodges and I said, hey, I'm really looking for something that I can do in terms of an internship or an assistantship. Can you help me? He said, well, you know, I, I don't really know what we have. Tell me a little about, bit about yourself. So I said, well, I've worked for the government and I've worked mostly with GIS or geographic information systems, mapping out impacts for um, water bodies and really connecting environmental indicators and doing impacts assessment to, to do vulnerability analysis to predict certain um, environmental outcomes in communities. He said, really? I said, yeah, that's what I've done. He said, well, why didn't you put that on your resume? I said, well, I just, I, I don't know. Um, and he said, well, that's exactly what we're looking for. So out of that meeting came another phone call and I ended up having an amazing experience working a graduate assistantship at the Energy Spatial Analysis and Research Lab in the JBJ for a year. And that was an incredible experience because I got to work with Dr. James Regans, who was at the time the Freeport McMoran Chair of Environmental Policy. Um, I also got to work with a team of scientists that were top notch and who served as mentors for me that entire year. So that's something that has really helped me to set my career apart. There were also a couple of courses here that I thought were critical and key to my success. One of them was environmental health risk assessment and Dr. Hartley taught me that course. And I had always been interested in cancer because both of my parents were cancer survivors. So I wanted to find out how that happens and, and, and what causes cancer and how the community and the environment influence cancer. So what, when I was here, I was working at the Energy Spatial Analysis and Research Lab and I was looking through courses and I met with Dr. Hartley and I said I really want something that's going to expose me to the community. So as a part of that course, something happened that completely changed me. We took a trip out to Shell Norco to attend a public meeting. and you know, you sit in class and you read about all these things and you take exams and, and you sort of stay confined, but this got us out into the community. And we walked into this public meeting as a class and Shell Oil was there, the community was there, 
Um, there were activists there. And it really floored me how the residents were directly affected by this facility. And that really helped me to put in perspective and to tie the public health aspect to the environmental part of the existence of that facility out there. And it was a, an eye-opening experience for me. Another great course I had was biostatistics. I took an SPSS class and it really taught me the basics of modeling. So if you all have a chance to take SAS or SPSS or any of the other modeling courses that, that you have at your disposal, I would suggest that you do so because that being, first of all, computer savvy is very important today, but being able to model and being IT savvy is also critical in navigating the employment landscape today. Lastly, a really interesting course was a course taught by Dr. Abdel Ghani, and it had a really long name, and it was the influence of human ecology on population behavior, and then it ran off the page. Um, but that was really interesting because it taught, he taught us, started with the history of medicine and, and, and brought us up to today and talked about environmental health and toxicology and epidemiology and community health systems. So it was a broad brush of environmental health sciences and how it connected to the community at large. Also, I have an interest and a passion in sustainability and corporate social responsibility. And today we hear about the triple bottom line. Have you all heard about the triple bottom line approach? People, planet, and profit. So we hear a lot about the planet. We hear a lot about climate change and that the, the Earth's temperature is rising uh, to dangerous levels. And we hear a lot about profit. We hear a lot about what companies are doing. It's amazing how little we hear about the public health impacts of climate change. So I'm very interested in that. And Dr. Abdul Ghani's course really started me off into thinking of, of strategies and ways that I could tie the public health portion into the environmental portion and into the corporate social responsibility portion. So what am I doing today? I work for the Disaster Recovery Program for the state of Texas. This is a housing and urban development appropriated program. Um, back in 2007, 2008, Hurricanes Ike and Dolly completely obliterated the Texas coastline. And it affected communities all along southeast Texas, deep east Texas, Galveston, down into the Rio Grande Valley. And as a result, Texas was awarded community development block grant funding in the amount of $3.1 billion for their rebuilding efforts. So the Texas General Land Office is my client. My company is embedded with the General Land Office, and I am an area manager covering the Southeast Texas region. This is what that region looks like. In the middle of the circle, uh, for those of you not familiar with Texas, there's the Galveston area where that big body of water is. So as you can imagine, that was the area hardest hit. But that area in blue, believe it or not, was the area affected by Hurricanes Ike and Dolly. So in my role as an area manager, I have to oversee all of the environmental, all of the engineering, and all of the construction and infrastructure rebuilding efforts for all of those communities that were affected. So we install things like generators, emergency generators at fire stations and hospitals and police stations. We rebuild roads. We rebuild drainage ditches. We rebuild or install um, health clinics in communities. We finished a project in Chambers County in Anahuac, Texas, where we rehabbed a clinic that now, as a result of our efforts, 
has mental health services, which is a critical service in the aftermath of a natural disaster. Another interesting project that we're working on that I find to be very, very innovative is a project right now in Beaumont, Texas at Lamar University. So when a storm hits, we see infrastructure damage. We see buildings, we see trees come down, we see the carnage all over. Well, this project in Beaumont at Lamar University is a technology commercialization center. So this will be a center that will serve as an outreach and job training hub for workers and residents of communities that have had their industries affected after the storms. Beaumont is a lot like New Orleans in that there are, in the New Orleans area, in that there are several chemical plants, there are several refineries. So if those things are impacted and they have to shut down, that's an immediate economic and social impact to the community. So right now, it's, it's a very exciting time in our disaster recovery program where we're getting to install this state-of-the-art training center so that employees and residents from all over can have somewhere to go if they are affected in terms of their profession after hurricanes. So what are employers looking for today? And I thought long and hard about this, and I, I thought, well, um, what really qualifies me to talk about this besides changing jobs 100 times? Um, but what I came to was that I've sat right where you guys are 13 years ago. Um, and over the course of my career, there's been many, many major items that have happened in U.S. history and in uh, international history that have affected my employment. I've worked through two Iraq wars. In fact, I was at Tulane during the first Iraq war. Um, during the second Iraq war, uh, there was an impact on the, on the industry that I was working in. Um, I've worked through the recent recession, which hit my industry very hard. So I just want to share with you all a little bit about what I've learned in terms of what employers are looking for. And I've also, did, I've also done recruiting for several of my employers. So one thing they're looking for is flexibility. This is very important, the ability to be flexible and adaptable. Remember what I was saying about theory and practice and how often practice is different from theory? Well, today, it's you have to be really smart about navigating the employment landscape and be really flexible. So when I started my current job, they had my position set up. I was set to go and work in the environmental group. I would be working on National Environmental Policy Act. Um, projects, I would be looking at environmental and health impacts. When I walked in the door, they said, yeah, that's changed, and we'd like you to work in the engineering group. I said, I don't want to work in the engineering group. I got a master's in public health to get out of the engineering profession. I said, well, we need you to do this for a little while because some things have changed in the project. And if it hasn't happened to you, I guarantee that it will happen to you at some time in your career, where you'll have to be flexible and adaptable and open. So I begrudgingly went into this engineering role, and six months later, they said, well, we're going to make you an area manager. Based on your performance and based on your willingness to kind of think outside of the box and um, relate what you're doing to environmental health sciences. So that has paid off tremendously for me. Something similar happened in the year 2000, right after I left the School of Public Health. 
I was trying to think of what I could do and where I could go to kind of fuse my engineering background with my environmental health sciences background. And I was recruited by a company called CDM. The only reason I went to work there is that they had strong ties with USAID, the US Agency for International Development. I wanted to work on those projects. I wanted to travel to Africa. I wanted to help communities in South Africa build water systems for their communities. That was my main goal. And something similar happened. When I got there, they said, well, those projects are a little bit um, off in the distance, but we need you to work on some water-related projects in Austin, Texas. And once again, I was pretty upset, but I had to be flexible. So what that did for me was I was exposed to working with the city of Austin, um, a lot of the local agencies, a lot of the local river authorities, and it exposed me to a lot of public sector clients, a lot of different communities, and it really expanded my knowledge of working in the municipal sector, which has made all the difference in me getting the current job that I have now with the Disaster Recovery Program. So be flexible and adaptable. The second thing, failure. I was reading a magazine just last week, and there's a quote that stuck out, and it said that a few years ago, failure was not an option, but today, it's an indispensable part of personal and professional growth. So do not be afraid to fail. I had a very interesting experience when I went to work for the American Cancer Society in 2004. I was involved in a layoff through no fault of my own from the consulting firm that I was working for. And I said, you know what? I haven't really fully used my environmental health sciences knowledge. I just want to jump straight into a nonprofit and work for something or an entity that I'm passionate about. American Cancer Society was that entity. And my advisor from Tulane actually advised against it. He said, do not go and work for a nonprofit. You will hate it. Um, they do not move at the pace that you like to move. And I think you should kind of stay where you are and do some different things. So I said, with all due respect, you're wrong. I'm going to do it anyway. Unfortunately, he was right. I went to work at the Cancer Society, wonderful organization. Um, and I was actually a program manager in the Steps to a Healthier Austin program. So George W. Bush at the time had appropriated millions of dollars dedicated to the study of asthma, obesity, and diabetes. And I was handling those things in the city of Austin. So I had to do outreach to churches. I had to do outreach to elementary schools. I was working in several schools and churches and overseeing tobacco cessation programs for students. I was working with hospitals and workplaces to do obesity outreach and doing diabetes education all over the community. And for some reason, that experience with the staff just did not click with me. We could not see eye to eye. I had my idea of the way I thought they should be done. Things should be done. They had their ideas and we just butted heads, which led to me leaving the Cancer Society very promptly. So after about four and a half months, I was out of a job and feeling very, very down. And I had feel, I, I felt that I had failed tremendously. I'd gotten laid off from my engineering position, jumped into this public health position, didn't work out. So what was I going to do? 
And that's where I have to decide, am I going to let this keep me down or am I going to try to use these two things and move forward? So I chose the latter. Um, it didn't work out, but I had to get creative and try something else, which brings me to the next item that employers would like for you to be creative. Use all of the crayons in the crayon box, as my three-year-old would say. Um, after that experience, I was wondering how I could stay connected to the field of public health and environmental health sciences. And I mentioned the Jennifer Altman Foundation. I was looking around on the internet and I found the environment section of the American Public Health Association. So out of the blue, I called the director of their environmental section and I said, hey, just been laid off. I really would like to help you, but I'm not working. Um, do you have anything for me to do? And I'm, I'm basically like I was talking to Ms. Freighter, I said, I would do anything you would like me to do to help you further your cause. And they said, well, you know what? We're looking for a program planner for the annual APHA conference. And I said, great, let me do it. What can I do? Um, said, well, we can't pay you. And I said, well, that's fine. I'll figure out something to do. I just want to be connected and involved. So I was able to work out a deal with the Jennifer Altman Foundation, which is a wonderful nonprofit organization that does a lot of work in environmental health and environmental justice. And that foundation paid my way to go to the public health conference that year in 2004 so that I could meet the people in the environment section, so that I could interact with other program planners, and so that I could get involved and be an active member of the organization. And that was a career changer for me. Um, I worked as a, program, as a program planner for an entire year, and that was one of the best experiences I've had because I was exposed to everything under the sun in environmental health sciences. I was exposed to the high incidence of cancer in, on Indian reservations in South Dakota, which I had no idea that there were so many Indian reservations in South Dakota. Um, I was exposed to air pollution studies and impacts all over the United States. I was exposed to um, non-point source pollution runoff in various rivers and lakes across the United States. So basically any abstract that was submitted to the section, I had to review and rate and choose for the next conference. But I got to talk to a lot of professors, I got to talk to a lot of industry folks, and that really helped to tie me to all of those folks into all of the community. So I had to, like I said, be creative about how I wanted to stay connected. Um, and even though I wasn't paid for that position, on my resume, I have that I was a program planner for the period of time when I was unemployed during that time in 2004, which has carried me a long way. So we've all heard this term, under promise and over deliver. How many people have heard that? Some? Okay. Throw that out the window. Um, I do not like that term because it sets you up to actually not deliver. So employers like for you to deliver what you say you can deliver. So be honest and what you say you can deliver. There was a time when I was working on a project in Houston and I was asked on a Thursday to fly out to Los Angeles that following Sunday to manage a project. I knew my plate was full. I knew that there was no way I could do it. 
and they said, well, just let us know. And I said, well, I'm kind of busy. My other projects may suffer if I take this on. And then they said, well, if you can't do it, then we'll find somebody who will. And that was, to me, that was like throw down. Um, and I did what a lot of people do for the fear of them thinking that I wasn't able to do it. I took on the project anyway, which was a disaster. I flew to LA, was overwhelmed. That project suffered. All of my other projects suffered because I did not have the courage to be honest with them and tell them, look, I can't take this on, or I can take this on, but I need help and these, the support and this amount of resources to take this on. So just be honest in what you can deliver. Afterward, I was very open and honest with them, and, and they were gracious enough to keep me. Um, but I was very honest with them afterward, and they really appreciated that. They li today, employers like to see that you are comfortable enough in who you are to execute on what you say you can execute on. So don't set yourself up for failure just because you think they want something more than you can give. And lastly, personal connectivity. A lot of folks call this networking, but today in social media circles, networking for a lot of people is LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. So we all have those things on our phones. Those things are great, but that is no substitute for actually being personally connected to someone. And that has made a lot of difference in my career as well, being personally connected to people, just the people in this room. Stay connected to your classmates. Stay connected now, try to stay connected afterward. This has made a huge difference for me as well. Um, in, in places that you may not think about it. There was an instance when I was an undergraduate at Tulane when I worked in the Career Services Center. And at that time, it was an in theory kind of place at Tulane in 1993. When you went to the Career Center, they used to put up the company and the GPA. If you did not have the GPA, do not bother putting your resume in the hat or putting your name down for this company because they wouldn't even look at you. So the Joint Warfare Analysis Center was interviewing on campus, and I had worked in the Career Center, and I had developed a really close relationship with the staff there to the point where I knew their kids, they knew my family, very close knit. So also at that time, I was in my last year of studies, wasn't really sure what I was going to do. So I had enrolled in the School of Public Health in 1993 with the intent of starting in January of 1994. So I left, had gotten the folks at the Joint Warfare Analysis Center set up, set up their interviews for students, and I went back to my dorm room. About an hour later, I got a call from the career services director. She said, put on a suit and get back over here. And I said, why? She said, you have an interview. I said, with who? She said, with the Joint Warfare Analysis Center. And I said, well, I don't have the GPA that they want. And she just said, just put on a suit and get back over here. So I went back over. And I said, I don't understand. Why, why am I here? And the recruiter said that he, the director told him that he would be very disappointed if he left the campus without interviewing me and another one of my classmates named Leroy Brown for this position. And even though we didn't have the GPAs, he convinced them to take a look at me. 
based on our experience because we both, both Leroy and I had been working internships and we had worked every summer at Tulane. So I interviewed with him and was telling him a lot about what I had been doing and I got the job. But it was all based on making a personal connection with the career planning folks. I didn't ask them to do it. They just spoke on my behalf. Um, another item which I thought would never um, matter in a million years is one of the many things I do in Austin is I work for a media company called Soul City. I've been volunteering for them for a while and I've been working with their film arm so I would work with Paramount and Lionsgate and Screen Gems to bring all of the sneak previews and the film screenings to Austin. So there's a secretary at my, one of my former companies who had a daughter who was a big Lindsay Lohan fan, the old Lindsay Lohan, not this Lindsay Lohan. Um, so this was around 2003, and I was doing a premiere of this Lindsay Lohan movie, Mean Girls. And I had boxes and boxes of all this pink stuff Lindsay Lohan mirrors and baby doll tees and all of this other stuff. So I went to the secretary, Karen, uh, our office administrator, and I said, hey, I know your daughter is a big Lindsay Lohan fan. Here's some tickets to the premiere. Please take some of this stuff off my hand. I have no use for body glitter and all this other stuff. Um, bring her to the movie. She'll have a great time. So she came out to the movie. So I was the guy who would set up the film and thank everyone for coming and her daughter was in the audience and I said hey honor everybody say hi to honor and they're like yay and she was just on cloud nine in the theater. Um, several years later I was driving here actually for the summer to visit my family and I got a call from that same secretary who had now moved to a company where she was the office manager and she said hey I know you have a degree in public health. There's a great opportunity at my company that's very entrepreneurial. I think you would be a perfect fit for it. And I said, really? And she said, yeah, we'd, we'd love to have you come in and interview. I said, well, great, yeah, I, I'll do it. Um, and it's those types of things that help to connect you with people where you would never know it. I was just trying to get rid of body glitter and it ended up in a position for me down the road just by making um, this young lady happy and um, inviting her to a movie screening. Um, so let's recap a little bit about the things I just spoke about. These are things that will help you to sell yourself to employers. Flexibility, be, being able to embrace failure and adversity, the ability to be creative, the ability to be honest in what you can deliver, and staying connected to people. Those are things that can help you. And in addition, like I said before, please tap into all of your interests and all of your hobbies. Those are things that can carry you very, very far and help to set you apart. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with is if there's not an opportunity out there, then it's up to you to create one. What we do here is in, in this school and at the School of Public Health is far reaching, it's innovative, it's, it's edgy, it's, it's, it's just an amazing program here at Tulane. Um, and translating that to industry can be difficult at times. But I just want you to, rem to remember that if your perfect cookie cutter opportunity doesn't exist, that you can use all of your tools personal tools, everything that you do to create the opportunity that you want. And if you start off at an agency, an NGO, 
a private firm and you don't have that perfect position that you thought you had, then by all means, create that opportunity for yourself and it'll pay off. Do we have any questions? Oh, you have a question? Um, you would like to stand up comic. Yes. You have to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I've done stand-up comedy here in New Orleans and in Austin. Uh, when I moved, I, I, I went to Tulane's undergraduate school and moved to Virginia, and as soon as I moved back here in 1996, there was a comedy troupe called Loose Cannons that performed all over New Orleans. A friend of mine from elementary school was the leader of that comedy troupe, and I said, I, I want to do what you guys are doing. He said, well, hey, come and audition for the troop. So I auditioned for the troop, um, became a member of the troop, and it was just like a Saturday Night Live type of group. We wrote and directed all of our own skits. We performed at the Sanger Theater a few blocks away. We performed at the first annual New Orleans Comedy Festival at the House of Blues. Um, Vibe Magazine approached us to do a couple of things. Um, with some characters that we had created in our comedy troupe, but we just used to travel all over the city doing sketch comedy. Um, one thing that that has helped me to pay off, that has helped me in my career, is that in sketch comedy, you have to walk into a room and size up the room very quickly because we've had shows where people are falling over laughing and we've had shows where people are like this for an hour. So we had to really navigate on the fly um, and really be able to read an audience and change up our material to make it applicable. That also led to a couple of acting gigs for me. Um, I had the good fortune of being an extra in Spy Kids 2. I was a Secret Service agent in that movie, so I got to hang out with the very short Antonio Banderas um, and Cheech and all of the little kids who are very grown now. Um, and I got to meet Haley Joel Osment on the set as well because his sister Emily was in the movie with us. Um, and I've also done a lot of theater in Austin, which is where I met my wife actually. She and I met, we played a married couple in a play, and we ended up getting married. Um, so it was kind of a life imitating art type of thing. So those are some other things that I've been interested in that, that have been really interesting to my employers in terms of having diversity and, and to have a connection to the arts and the community as well. Yes? So you can go in and explain all of your assets. How do you get your foot in the door? Well, it's just a piece of paper that needs to get sifted. You have to be creative and use as many of your resources as you can. Um, I would use lean on the staff heavily here. They were very helpful to me. Um, when I was looking, there weren't a lot of opportunities out there, so um, I had to really expand what I was looking for. Um, so I had to, I, I didn't lower my standards, I just allowed myself to pursue other things that I probably wouldn't have pursued normally. Um, also, on your resume, you can put those types of things, but um, I'll give you one of my cards. There's a new resume format that actually allows you to list some interesting things about yourself in the margin that have served a lot of my friends and colleagues very well. Um, and I would really rely on 
your network for things like that because, um, like I said, it's a tough employment landscape today, but companies really like referrals. Um, I've used LinkedIn to reach out to various people and I've said, hey, you, you're functioning in this position. I would like to set up a conversation with you. And, and amazingly, a lot of people accept me and we've set up face-to-face -face meetings or we've set up phone conversations where they kind of tell me, oh, well, I get to introduce myself and learn about them, but they tell me, well, this may be hard for you to break into here, but let me connect you to this other person that may be able to help you. So it just involves doing things a little bit differently and being as creative as you can. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I am a very good person on personal connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just coming to a new area, new city, it takes time to kind of um, format those relationships. Yes. And I'm just wondering, like, when you first went to uh, Texas, how easy was that to establish and just set up in, a, in place? Because, you know, I've, you only have like a year and a half, two years here for your right. master's. Mm -hmm. And how do you just set that up so that you do have those good personal connections to get you your, to your next step? Well, I relied on those things I asked you to think about. Um, when I moved to Texas, um, roller skating actually helped me to get connected. Um, about four or five blocks from here, there was a skating rink called Three Piece Skating Rink on Claiborne Avenue, where I used to go almost every day when I was growing up. Um, and when I got to Texas, there was a social um, that a lot of the young professionals were having at the skating rink. And I, I went to that and, um, you know, it, it, it was a way for me to kind of let loose and, and to um, teach people how to skate, actually. I never thought I would use that, but that helped me to get connected to a lot of people that I would not have otherwise been connected to. Um, also, when you're in a new city, um, I would look for um, campus events that are going on. Um, in Texas, for example, um, I'm an anomaly because most of my coworkers either went to University of Texas or Texas A&M. So they all have this camaraderie and they have all of these events that go on. So I just um, started to align myself with their alumni events to learn more about their campuses and to learn more about them. And then I started, I, I contacted the Tulane alumni, um, the undergraduate alumni affairs department, and there were several Tulane alumni in the area that also helped me to get acclimated. And it took some time, but um, you just have to get out there and, and, and meet as many people as you can and be patient because it takes time, especially if you're in a, a new and different place. Do we have anyone else? Well, thank you all for coming. This is my contact information, um, and I'm sure it'll, it'll be sent to you. Um, I have some business cards available up here as well. It may be kind of hard to see since it's in, it's in purple, um, but my work, my work email is on there, my personal email, uh, my personal and work cell phone is on there, and my LinkedIn. I have, I have business cards as well that I can give to you. And please reach out to me. I will email you back. I will call you back. If you need any help, I'm here to help you. Um, I have contacts at various agencies. There are various, as you see, I've worked for various companies that um, if you're interested in opportunities there, I'm happy to refer you. So please, please, please reach out to me and I am happy to connect you to my friends and my colleagues in the industry. So.
thank you.